Stu at home for joining us the, this hour. Um, the correct title of the song, in case you ever need to look it up, is Whoop. There it is. The first word is Whoop. W H O O M P. Whoop. It's from 1993. It's from a band from Miami called Tag Team. And whether or not that sounds familiar to you, you know exactly what song I'm talking about. It is not a complicated refrain, right? You know that song. You know that refrain. Okay. Raise your hand if you definitely knew that the first word of that song title was whoomp, W-H-O-O-M-P. Did you definitely? Did you definitely know it was Whoop? How many people within the sound of my voice tonight thought maybe the title was Whoop or maybe Oops? <laughs> Oops, there it is. It's a little unclear the way they say it. Had you ever really thought hard about it? There is literally a board game based on the misconception that the lyric actually starts with Poop, there it is. It is a board game, I kid you not, that involves a spring-loaded toilet that shoots a plastic poop up into the air, and the competitors in the game try to grab it, and the tagline is, poop, there it is. Okay, if you were alive and sentient in America in 1993, that song, whether you thought it was whoop, oops, whoop, or poop, that is a song that very easily stuck in your brain. And now, that is about to be the theme song. Uh, for the Trump White House, for their response to the Mueller report, and for specifically how the Democratic-led Congress will be able to approach the potential impeachment of President Trump for conduct described in that report. Because, whoop, there it is, we now know the exact moment the Trump White House completely, oops, screwed it up when it came to former White House counsel Don McGahn, who served in the Trump administration, who's only just recently left, there's an important moment when it comes to him. The moment when the White House, whoop, really screwed it up when it arrived in the fall of 2017. Although we did not find out about that whoop, there it is moment until months later. It was first reported last year in the New York Times. Special counsel Robert Mueller had been appointed earlier in 2017, in May 2017. Then in the fall of 2017, according to the New York Times, Quote, Mueller's office asked to interview Trump's White House counsel, Don McGahn. Quote, to the surprise of the White House counsel's office, to the surprise of Don McGahn's office, President Trump and his lawyers signaled that they had no objection to Mueller interviewing Don McGahn. Quote, Mr. McGahn was stunned, as was his own lawyer, Bill Burke, whom McGahn had recently hired out of concern that he needed help to stay out of legal jeopardy. Mr. Burke has explained to others that he told White House advisors that they did not appreciate the president's legal exposure and that it was, quote, insane that Mr. Trump did not fight a McGahn interview in court. Quote, Mr. McGahn and his lawyer, Mr. Burke, could not understand why Trump was so willing to allow Don McGahn to speak freely to the special counsel. But he did raise no objections. McGahn was free to go speak to the special counsel. And he did. I mean, Don McGahn, much to his own surprise, perhaps much to his own chagrin, he was allowed by the White House to go speak with the special counsel, to go tell the special counsel everything that he knew. McGahn does that for dozens of hours. He then ends up in the redacted Mueller report being cited more than 150 times as Mueller methodically goes through all of these instances in which the president appears to have obstructed justice. And that ends up being hugely, hugely important for two reasons. Number one, we get McGahn's testimony. We get all of these narrative facts about all these times the president allegedly obstructed justice while in office. We'll have more on that in just a second. In fact, we'll have more on that <laughs> over the course of the next year, more than you'd think. But that moment with them clearing Don McGahn to go talk to Mueller it also ends up being critically important for the way the scandal is ultimately going to resolve overall. Because, oops, when the White House cleared Don McGahn to go to the special counsel, to go to Mueller's office and talk about everything he saw and participated in and heard while he was in the White House, when the White House, oops, cleared him to go do that, to go convey that information without restriction to Robert Mueller and his investigators in the special counsel's office, there it is. 
That was really important. By clearing him to do that, the Trump White House waived any claim they might otherwise have asserted that what Don McGahn saw and heard and witnessed in the Trump White House might be covered by executive privilege and therefore couldn't be discussed with anyone outside the White House. Right? Executive privilege exists. If the White House chooses to assert that, that means that something that happened in the White House, something that happened in relation to the president, can't be conveyed outside of the original context in which it existed. In the White House, with the president, it can't go any further. If they had chosen, if they had chosen to assert executive privilege to block Don McGahn from testifying about his time as White House counsel, they could have blocked him from testifying, potentially, to Robert Mueller about anything. But they didn't. They had the chance to do it, but whoop, they blew it. They let him go. You can't say that material wasn't privileged when he testified about it to Robert Mueller and then later try to say that that same material is covered by executive privilege if McGahn is asked to testify about it to some other body, to some other proceeding, to some other investigators. Material is either privileged or it's not. And once you've let it out of the White House, you've waived your right to assert that it is privileged. Oops. And you have seen this dynamic at work in this investigation already, just since the Democrats took over the House in January of this year, right? Democrats immediately started sending out requests for, for documents and for information uh, from people who have already been questioned in Mueller's investigation or people who have already been questioned by other congressional committees. You might remember when the Judiciary Committee under Jerry Nadler, remember they sent out 81 requests for documents? to everybody from you know, Steve Bannon to Hope Hicks to Cambridge Analytica to Reince Priebus. Yes, that was an incredibly wide-ranging, massive document request to dozens of peoples and entities associated with the Trump campaign and the Trump White House. But as the Judiciary Committee explained at the time, those requests were actually pretty simple and uncomplicated from a legal perspective. Because all of those requests, at least in that initial round of requests, everything they were asking for was material that those people and those entities had already handed over. They'd already submitted it either to other congressional committees or to other law enforcement entities or to the special counsel and the White House therefore had not asserted executive privilege to block the conveying of that material, right? That made all of those requests to all of those 81 people and entities fairly simple under the law. Once the White House has allowed somebody to hand over materials to some entity outside the White House, whether it is a congressional committee or a legal investigation or whatever, the White House has thereby given up its ability to claim that those materials have to be kept secret and they have to be kept within the White House because they're covered by executive privilege. Again, stuff is either privileged or it is not. You can't say it's privileged for some audiences and not for other audiences. It's either privileged or it's not. When it comes to White House counsel Don McGahn, <laughs> they didn't assert executive privilege to block him from speaking to the special counsel, which he then did extensively. From the special counsel's redacted report, we now have pretty good evidence that President Trump never really understood the importance of that decision or the importance of his overall dynamic with his White House counsel. Um, this is from volume two of the redacted Mueller report, um, starting on page 113. Quote, on January 25th, 2018, the New York Times reported that the previous June, June 2017, the president had ordered White House counsel Don McGahn to have the Justice Department fire special counsel Robert Mueller. According to the Times article, amid the first wave of news media reports that Mueller was examining a possible obstruction case, the president began to argue that Mueller had conflicts of interest that disqualified him from overseeing the investigation. The article further reported that after receiving the president's order to fire Mueller, the White House counsel, Don McGahn, refused, saying he would quit instead. The article stated that the president ultimately backed down after the White House counsel threatened to resign rather than carry out the directive. After the article was published, the president dismissed the story when asked about it by reporters, saying, fake news, folks, fake news, a typical New York Times fake story. But then the next day, on January 26th, 2018, the day after the Times posted that story, the president's personal lawyer called Don McGahn's attorney and said that the president wanted Don McGahn to put out a statement denying that he had been asked by the president to fire Mueller and denying that he had threatened to quit in protest. 
McGahn's attorney informed the president's personal counsel that the New York Times, excuse me, McGahn's attorney relayed that McGahn would not make any such statement. McGahn's attorney informed the president's personal counsel that the New York Times story was accurate in reporting that the president had wanted Mueller removed. Then the following week, the president was apparently still steaming about that New York Times story, still worried about the implications for himself about that New York Times story that he had ordered the firing of Robert Mueller, that he had told Don McGahn to do it, that McGahn had threatened to resign as a way of making the president back off that demand. On February 5th, 2018, according to Mueller's report, quote, the president directed White House Staff Secretary Rob Porter to tell Don McGahn to create a record to make clear that the president never directed that McGahn should fire Mueller. The president said he wanted McGahn to write a letter to the file for our records and wanted something beyond a press statement to demonstrate that the New York Times reporting was inaccurate. The president referred to McGahn as a, quote, lying bastard and said that he wanted a record from him. Rob Porter recalled the president saying something to the effect of, if McGahn does not write a letter, then maybe I will have to get rid of him. Later that day, Rob Porter spoke to Don McGahn to deliver the president's message. Porter told McGahn that he had to write a letter to dispute that he was ever ordered to terminate the special counsel. McGahn shrugged off the request. Porter told McGahn that the president suggested that McGahn would be fired if he did not write the letter. McGahn dismissed the threat. McGahn said he would not write the letter that the president had requested. The following day, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly scheduled time for Don McGahn to meet with him, John Kelly, and the president in the Oval Office, again to discuss the New York Times article. The morning of the meeting, the president's personal lawyer called Don McGahn's attorney and said the president was going to be speaking with McGahn, and McGahn could not resign no matter what happened in the meeting. That makes you look forward to the meeting. Quote, the president began the Oval Office meeting by telling McGahn that the New York Times story did not look good and McGahn needed to correct it. McGahn recalled the president saying, I never said to fire Mueller. I never said fire. This story does not look good. You need to correct this. You are the White House counsel. The president seems to understand that the word counsel means lawyer in this context. But the president does not seem to understand at this moment that the White House counsel is not his personal lawyer who needs to do as he directs. The White House counsel works for the presidency. The White House counsel's job is not to clear things up in the, president, in the press to make the president look good on the president's orders. The president appears to be somewhat flummoxed by this slowly dawning revelation. Um, but then, th th this is the next page, page 117, quote, the president asked McGahn in the meeting why he had told spe the special counsel's office that the president had told him to have Mueller removed. McGahn responded that he had to tell the special counsel's office that and that his conversations with the president were not protected by attorney-client privilege. At which point, dawn perhaps starts to break for the president, right? Wait, 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 wait now. You have been telling the special counsel true things? You have, been, you have been telling the special counsel about stuff that has actually happened here, and you feel constrained to tell the truth, not to just say stuff that I tell you to say? You have been taking notes on things that actually happen, and then conveying the stuff that you took notes on to the special counsel's office, and I can't stop you from doing it? I can't make you lie to them? I can't make you create false documents denying what you've told. I mean, this is, this part of the Mueller report is a remarkable narrative, right, about how things are being run in your White House under this president, including the president's apparent confusion as to what he can order people to do and not. But this is also strong, detailed evidence of the president in this instance, in this circumstance, committing a crime committing felony obstruction of justice. I mean, this is just one of the alleged instances of obstruction of justice that Mueller appears to be saying he would have charged the president with this thing were this not the president, were he anyone else on earth. I mean, the implication of this whole part of Mueller's report is that Trump is only not being charged with felony obstruction of justice for incidents like this because of the Justice Department policy that says you shouldn't indict or prosecute a sitting president. We can tell that's what Mueller is doing here because Mueller doesn't just describe what the president did in some purely narrative, novelistic way, although this is narrative and novelistic. 
What Mueller does here is that he describes what the president did. He provides the evidentiary basis for all of those assertions about what the president did. But then he goes on to connect all of the elements of the president's described behavior specifically to the necessary legal elements of obstruction of justice that you have to prove if you as a prosecutor are going to justify bringing criminal charges against somebody under the obstruction of justice statutes. Right, there are three legal elements that you need to prove, that you need to have firm evidence of if you're going to bring charges against somebody for obstruction of justice. Obstructive act, nexus, and intent. And in every instance in this whole section of the report, Mueller describes the president's behavior, and then immediately after, he describes what about that behavior constitutes an obstructive act under the law, what about this describes a nexus to an official proceeding under the law? And what about this provides evidence of the president's criminal and corrupt intent under the law? For this one instance involving Don McGahn, under intent, it's quite clear, quote, substantial evidence indicates that in repeatedly urging Don McGahn to dispute that he was ordered to have the special counsel terminated, the president acted for the influence, excuse me, for the purpose of influencing McGahn's account in order to deflect or prevent further scrutiny of the president's conduct toward the investigation. Tonight, reporter Charlie Savage at the New York Times has just posted what is, in effect, an index from Mueller's findings, going through all the alleged incidents of the president's obstruction of justice as described in Mueller's report. In at least four of those instances, when you look at not just the described conduct of the president and how egregious it seems, but legally, whether or not Mueller was able to establish evidence of an obstructive act committed by the president, an obstructive act having a nexus to an ongoing investigation, and that obstructive act linked to an ongoing investigation being motivated by corrupt intent, when you look clinically and legally at whether or not Mueller establishes all three of those elements in order to find sufficient basis for bringing criminal charges against somebody who did these things in at least four distinct cases, as the Times puts it, quote, the quote, bottom line is that the report suggests there is sufficient evidence to ask a grand jury to consider charging this act as illegal obstruction. That is true for Trump trying to fire Mueller. It is true for Trump trying to encourage Paul Manafort not to cooperate with the investigation. It's true for Trump trying to get Jeff Sessions to unrecuse himself from the Russia investigation in order to intervene in Mueller's inquiry. And it's true for Trump pushing Don McGahn to create some sort of record denying that Trump tried to get him to fire Robert Mueller. In all of those instances, according to what is plainly laid out in Mueller's report, all of those instances contain the elements you would need in order to present this information, this fact pattern, and this evidence to a grand jury in order to produce an indictment. Were the alleged perpetrator here not serving as President of the United States? Now, the problem for the White House, given that, is number one, they can't stop any federal prosecutor from actually bringing these charges once Trump is out of office, provided his term in office does not outlast the statute of limitations on these crimes. But two, they can't stop Congress, even now, while President Trump is still in office, they can't stop Congress from pulling all of these threads and following all of this evidence and investigating these matters themselves. And specifically when it comes to all the stuff that Don McGahn testified to, to Robert Mueller. And again, he is cited more than 150 times just in the obstruction section of Mueller's report. When it comes to Don McGahn, the Trump White House cannot stop Don McGahn from publicly testifying in Congress about all of the same stuff he talked to Robert Mueller about. Because the White House, whoops, allowed him to testify about this stuff to Robert Mueller. And so that toothpaste is out of the tube. <laughs> Stuff is either privileged or it's not. They did not assert privilege to prevent Meg McGahn from talking about it to Mueller. And because of that, they will not be able to assert executive privilege over that material to keep McGahn from talking about it to Congress. They will not be able to keep McGahn from responding to a congressional subpoena to testify about all of that same stuff he already talked to Mueller about. That said, why not try anyway? Maybe you'll at least get some sort of delay. Tonight, the Washington Post was first to report that the White House will try to fight the congressional subpoena that was issued to Don McGahn yesterday by the Judiciary Committee. In addition to trying to block testimony by McGahn, which I don't think anybody thinks they will be able to do, 
Uh, the Post also reports tonight that the White House strategy from here on out will not be just to try to block testimony by McGahn. It'll be to try to block testimony from any current White House official or any former White House official in conjunction with any incidents or testimony that were revealed in Mueller's report. And I mean, God bless them, right? I mean, they will give it a go. They will give it a try. They will certainly earn themselves some delays by doing so. But they are not on strong legal ground in any of these efforts to stop these investigations now. I mean, they might have been with Don McGahn had they gotten it right in the first instance, but they didn't. And so Don McGahn will be stuck in the middle now for a little while while the White House tries to put up a legal fight against his subpoena. But they're not a party to the subpoena. And this, frankly, as a matter of executive privilege, was all settled in the fall of 2017. Whoop, there it is, when they let him testify about this stuff to Mueller. Really? Okay. Are you sure you want me to? Okay, here I go. I mean, that was the end of their claims that executive privilege would protect that material from disclosure to investigators. But, I mean, they'll, they'll try to block everything. The White House is also trying to block another third party, in this case the president's accounting firm, Mazars from handing over Trump-related financial documents to the House Oversight Committee. And again, it'll be the same dynamic. Mazars will be stuck in the middle for a little while while the White House tries to mount a legal effort that quashes the subpoena from Congress to this accounting firm. They'll get a delay. Oversight Committee Chairman Elijah Cummings tonight says he will delay the enforcement of that subpoena for Mazars until a court has weighed in on the new Trump lawsuit that is trying to stop that accounting firm from responding to the congressional subpoena. But that accounting firm is going to have to respond to that congressional subpoena. I mean, the case law on this and the precedent here is absolutely clear. The White House and the president will have no leg to stand on when it comes to trying to block that subpoena. I mean, tonight, the White House and the Treasury Department are also trying to block the Ways and Means Committee chairman from obtaining the president's tax returns, despite black letter law that clearly says the IRS shall hand such returns over at the request of that committee chairman. And again, they will succeed in getting a little bit of a delay here. Stephen Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, says he, he plans to get back to the committee on this matter on May 6th. Okay, so says you, but it's not really your position to say. The Ways and Means Committee chairman has already said that if today's deadline were not met for handing over the president's tax returns, he would consider that to be a denial of his request. Tonight, that committee chairman, Chairman Richie Neal of Massachusetts, says he is consulting with counsel about what his next steps will be. But spoiler alert, there will be a subpoena here <laughs> down the road. He's not saying that, but it's clear that's where this, this is heading. And again, the black letter law is against the White House on this, and so they can fight it. And they can put out these weird letters and legal memos like they did under Steven Mnuchin's name today that did not cover him in glory. And they will, try to glo they will try to delay these things, and they will try to create the illusion of a big legal fight here. But they're not on strong ground. And listen, with, with all of these things, the White House saying, no, 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 you can't have the testimony. No, you can't have the documents. No, nobody should cooperate with these investigations. I mean, it's impressive for its uniformity. It's impressive for the almost reflexive nature with which they're saying no to every request. Oversight Committee Chairman has been pointing out that this entire year, the White House has refused to hand over even a single document or to make available a single witness. They're saying no to everything. And that earns them delay but they're not ultimately in a strong position on any of it. Tonight, the Oversight Committee took the first steps toward contempt of Congress vote for the Trump-appointed official who was reportedly involved in overturning security clearance rejections for more than two dozen White House staff, including, including senior White House advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Well, that one's not gonna go away, right? I mean, you can try to delay this guy from stopping, from speaking to Congress. You can try to keep the security clearance official away from the committee that has oversight over these matters. But this one's going to get worse, not better, right? Given the findings of even the redacted Mueller report, it's clearer than ever why the White House would want to block testimony about why so many senior Trump officials were rejected by career security staff when they applied for security clearances, and why the Trump White House nevertheless weighed in and intervened to grant those security clearances anyway. I mean, Jared Kushner today did a very rare public event uh, at, a, at, a, at a, a event for Time Magazine in which he was supposed to be taking public questions. He doesn't do this very often. Well, I don't know what he thought he was going to be asked to talk about five days after the Mueller report came out, but did you control F your name in that report, sir? I mean, the, the questions right off the bat for him today were, 
can we talk about you going to the Trump Tower meeting with the Russians to get dirt on Hillary Clinton and you meeting with the sanctioned Russian banker during the transition and you meeting with the Russian ambassador and not reporting it during the transition and you trying to establish some sort of secret back channel to the Russian government and you receiving some previously secret drop sanctions on Russia plan from your friend who was working with a Russian guy who said the plan was personally approved by Putin and then you gave the personally approved by Putin plan directly to the Secretary of State and to senior White House advisor Steve Bannon. Can we talk about that stuff? <laughs> Jared Kushner's um, first uh, response <laughs> to all those questions tonight, uh, today at that Time Magazine event was, uh, quote, so first of all, thank you for having me here today. <laughs> you know? To which he gets follow-up questions. Why didn't the campaign, the Trump campaign, say, hey, Russia, we don't need your help. We don't want your help. Please stop. Question, are you concerned that Russian intelligence services were trying to find ways to influence you and other people close to Trump? Question, Mr. Kushner, can we talk about what the FBI was concerned about when they were looking into your background for permanent security clearance at the White House? Right? Yes, of course the White House wants to block the guy who massaged all these security clearances, including the one for Jared Kushner, given what we now know for sure about Jared Kushner. Of course they want the security clearance overturning guy to testify, to, to not testify to Congress. But the White House, as understandable as their reticence may be on these things, they're not on strong legal ground from blocking these investigations from going forward and from blocking administration personnel from having to respond to subpoenas. I mean, the, the Mueller report, as yet, is still full of redactions. It is already, even its, it, in its redacted form, sparking more areas of investigation and more areas of concern and public questions that senior White House officials don't have answers for. The White House right now is trying to block absolutely every aspect they can of these ongoing and now newly intensifying investigations. You'd see why they'd want to try. The president tonight called one specific Washington Post reporter to explain his thinking on how he's trying to stop all these investigations and why he thinks he'll be able to. His reasoning was uh, something other than persuasive, but you will want to hear what he said. That reporter joins us next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.